Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. We've had two seminal events in the last three years, which I believe signal the end game for the great industrial revolution based on fossil fuels. The first event, July 2008, you recall that month. Oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And the prices for all things, from grocery to gasoline, went through the roof. Purchasing power plummeted. And the entire economic engine of the Industrial Revolution shut down in July 2008 at 147 a barrel. That was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. My colleagues in governments and a lot of industry around the world are still dealing with the aftershock and haven't got to the nub of the crisis. And until we understand this crisis, we're not going to be able to find a way out and create new solutions for society. We have hit peak globalization. We now are in an end game. We now know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this world based on fossil fuels. It's about 145 to 150 a barrel, and it'll keep shutting down. The reason we've hit this dangerous end game is because the whole world relies on fossil fuels. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. All of our construction materials, from plastic to cement, are based on fossil fuels. Virtually all of our pharmaceutical products are made from fossil fuels. Our synthetic fiber, our power, our transport, our heat, our light, we have built a great short-lived civilization based on digging up the burial grounds of the Carboniferous Age. This is a carbon-based civilization. So in 2007, when oil started to go over 80 a barrel, something interesting happened. All the other prices across the supply chain went up. At $120 a barrel, we had food riots in 22 countries because 40% of the human race today lives on $2 a day or less. And when the price of wheat, barley, rye, and rice were doubling and trebling because of the oil cost, we had a billion people in harm's way. And the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization was worried about the prospect of mass hunger and starvation. The reason this is happening is because we've reached peak oil per capita and peak oil production. They're related. Peak oil per capita actually happened in 1979. BP did the study. There's been many studies co collaborating this since. Had we distributed all the crude oil that we had in 1979 to everyone living on the planet at that moment of time, and we shared it, that's the most each person could have. We found more oil since then, but population rose quicker. So if we distributed all the crude oil we have now to 6.8 billion people, there's simply less to go around. Adding to this, we now have hit peak oil production. Peak oil production is a geological term. It's when half the oil reserves are used up on the classic Hubert bell curve in geology. When half those global oil reserves are used up, it's over because you cannot afford the price on the downside of that curve. There's been a lot of controversy about peak oil. But last year, the International Energy Agency, which we rely on, the world, for the statistics on oil, they put this to rest. And they announced that we probably peaked on global oil production in 2006 at 70 million barrels a day. We'll plateau down to 69 million barrels a day for the next 20 years. But listen to this. It's going to cost us $7 trillion to get the remaining oil out. So you recall, after the economic engine shut down in 2008, the economy stopped and oil went down to $30 a barrel because there was no economic activity. As soon as we started replenishing inventories in 2010, oil shot up to 100 again. Prices went up across the supply chain, and purchasing power is now plummeting. Why? When India and China made a bid in the last 15 years to bring one-third of the human race into the game, at an 8, 10, 12 percent growth rate, the aggregate demand against that crude oil supply was just too great. And so we're now toward, moving toward a second collapse. 2010-11, we replenish inventories. Oil prices go over $80 a barrel. 
All the other prices are going up from grocery to pharmaceutical products to construction materials. Purchasing power is now going down again, and we're on the cusp of a second collapse. This is an end game. And what I'm saying here is this. Every time we try to regrow the economy at the same rate we were growing before 2008, we will see oil go up, everything else will go up, purchasing power will shut down in a couple of year intervals, and it'll collapse again. This is a wild gyration. We're going to see four year cycles of growth collapse, growth collapse. Try to start the engine, shut it down. This is going to go on for the next 25 years. And it's no wonder many of my colleagues and the economists, they don't want to deal with this because we'd have to have a very serious wake up call on where we're headed as a species and as a civilization. So peak globalization, 147 a barrel. The second major event, Copenhagen, December 2009, our world leaders from 192 countries assemble, and their mission is to address climate change, the entropy bill for the industrial age. And this is not a metaphor if you're an engineer here. We are paying the entropy bill. The first and second industrial revolution, we use massive amounts of carbon. We spewed a massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. And the short and long of it is, now we have so much CO2 up there and nitrous oxide and methane, it's blocking the atmosphere. So when the sun's heat hits the earth, the heat tries to radiate back off the planet, it hits all those CO2 molecules and it forces it back down. How bad is it? It's much worse than we're being told. In 2007, our scientists in the UN panel on climate change issued their long-awaited assessment report. I was in Paris. It was published in Paris. President Chirac asked me to come to address the question, what does the world economy do now? And the first thing I had to say to the world leaders there is that I had gotten it wrong for 30 years, which is not an easy acknowledgment. While I wrote about climate change in 1980 in a book you may recall, you older folks, called Entropy, and we worked for 25 years to address this in public policy, I continue to underestimate the speed of climate change because it's so difficult to wrap our minds around the feedback loops, and that's what's terrifying us now. So our scientists say we may have a three degree Celsius rise in temperature on, on this earth in this century. Now that's looking optimistic. It could go much higher. But to put this in perspective for the parents here, if we go up three degrees in this century, it takes us back to the temperature on earth three million years ago in the Pliocene, completely different ecosystems. It's all about the water cycle. It's all about the hydrology of the planet. For every one degree centigrade, that the temperature rises on this earth, the atmosphere absorbs 7% more precipitation from the ground. It just sucks up that precipitation. So that means the whole water cycle of the earth is thrown off kilter. More floods, more droughts, more wildfires, more extreme weather patterns, and that's exactly what's going on. And now we're seeing a dramatic impact on agriculture and infrastructure from extreme weather. The ecosystems cannot catch up to this shift in the hydrological and water cycle. They just can't do it in such a short period of time. So how bad is it? I advised the European Union. We went to Copenhagen. We are hoping to talk the world into mitigating climate change at 450 parts carbon per million by 2050 with the thought we'd go up two degrees, devastating, but we might survive. No other country even wanted to play our game. But then James Hansen threw a curve on us. He's the chief climatologist for the United States government, the head of the NASA Goddard Space Institute. And he said to Brussels, you've got your numbers wrong. If you mitigate at 450 parts carbon per million by 2050, the geological record shows you don't go up two degrees. We go up six degrees Celsius in this century. And this is a paraphrase, the end of human civilization as we've come to know it. As my wife says, we're sleepwalking as a species. We're in deep denial. And so our world leaders in Copenhagen couldn't cut the deal. The entire proceedings broke up in acrimony. It was shameful. And yet this was the most important decision that the human race ever had to make, a climate change, uh, climate change arrangement that would allow us to address this enormous change in the temperature of this planet. So we've hit peak globalization at 147 a barrel. Every time we try to regrow the economy, we're going to have growth, collapse, growth, collapse. 
We could go to dirtier fossil fuels like tar sands from Canada, heavy oil in Venezuela, and coal.